almost there. Fantastic, great. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for coming to this presentation. I'm glad that we had enough room for everyone. My name is Mark Boyajan, and I work for Neutrik. I'm based out of Charlotte. I am the Applications Manager for, you guessed it, Xerium Pro. So uh, Neutrik makes a number of different connectors. You know we make copper connectors. We make fiber connectors, which some of you may or may not know. And we also now make a gigantic wireless connector, and that is called Xerium Pro. And essentially, I'm going to tell you a little bit about the product, and then we're going to go into the technology itself as to how you make this work. Xerium was designed to transmit up to two channels of audio, up to two, 20 to 20 kilohertz, completely uncompressed and uncompanded, so we're not messing with the waveform. And it can do that at distances of up to one half of a mile between a transmitter and a receiver, or up to one mile with the use of a repeater. And it can do all of this with a fixed latency of 3.6 milliseconds or less. So in a nutshell, that's what this product does, okay? It is a modular product, so today what we're looking at in this transmitter, I've got a line level analog module, and I'll pop that out. So in here is a 48 watt hour module. So this gives you about continuous use, depending on how much output power you have. You have certain modes engaged, but on average, you can expect about 10 hours of continuous runtime. This line level analog module we have, we also have an AES EBU module, and we also have a Dante module. And before you get too excited, because I can see it in your faces, uh, the Dante module is still only two channels. Okay? We've only got so much bandwidth. When we can finally figure out that 64 channels or more of Dante over the same bandwidth, we can do all of this on my amazingly beautiful 140 foot yacht and I'll fly everyone out there myself, so it won't be a problem. But for today, we can do two channels. And on the receivers, we also have the same corresponding modules. So we have line-level analog audio, we have AES, and we have Dante, but we have a fourth module for the receivers, and that is a repeater module. The difference that you'll note from here is that you can see there's only one connector as opposed to any other kind of audio connector. That's because this device's job is solely to take up to two channels from a transmitter and retransmit those to any one of the receivers that are within range. And I'll talk a little bit more about that once we kind of get farther down. But this one here just has the power connector on it. It is signal agnostic, at least within the, the signal types that we offer. So in this case, I have a line level analog module here, but let's say that coming out of my console, I had Dante and I needed to go to speakers on sticks or my J array and I needed line level analog or even AES. I could simply put a Dante module in the transmitter, put my analog or my AES module, convert right in the air. So you don't have to necessarily think about what do I need where, you just really have to think about the location for the antennas and the devices themselves and then at the end you can worry about what module you pop in based on the signal type you need at that location. So where the battery in that, that module is kind of the brawn of the product, the top of this, the, what we call the base station, is really the brains of the product. And that you can adjust in here. For example, we transmit our audio at five gigahertz. So we're in what we call super high frequency or SHF land. Most of you are probably very comfortable with UHF and VHF in a space that's obviously dwindling, unfortunately, based on, to, based on uh, FCC sell-offs. This works out of that band, so you're not going to be robbing anybody of any of these other channels. And by the way, I should mention too, uh, you know we make connectors, that's what we do. And you know that the amazing companies, wireless companies out there that use our connectors in their products, this was never designed to compete with them. Up until something like Xerium Pro, you were using either an in-ear monitor or a belt pack to be able to transmit your audio long distances or just over obstacles that you would have to encounter. There was never anything really specifically designed to transmit the entire concert, if you will, or whatever ever was coming out of the console over railroad tracks or bodies of water or through walls or around buildings or what have you. So that's where this product, that's the space that Xerium Pro plays in. Again, it's not to compete with anything else out there because let's face it, until today, if you've seen the advertisements, you, you see it today and you go, wow, that is a very big belt pack. And you are correct. It is the biggest belt pack ever made. It comes with Kevlar suspenders. This way you can hold it up. Obviously, this is not something you're going to be running around the stage with. The guitar player would impale himself if he tried to do anything like that. This is designed to be installed, okay? Whether that's permanent or temporary, it's designed to be mounted to something. Truss work, 
uh, maybe a speaker stand with a long telescoping arm, um, a wall like, with a thing that you can mount it to. So three signal types. We're running at 5 gigahertz for the audio of those signal types, but then we also have a second antenna. This is running at 2.4 gigahertz. It's for setup, monitoring, and control, and that's all done via a tablet app. And uh, you're not going to be able to see it from here, and I apologize for that, but this is a free app that you can download on either the iTunes store or on the Google Play store. And it allows you to see what's going on inside the devices. For example, you'll be able to see things like signal level. You'll be able to turn and adjust channels. This device itself has the ability to use eight different RF channels, three in Uniband 1 and five in Uniband 3. And let's talk about that a little bit, too. If you were to look at the FCC map, uh, I mean, every frequency, the frequency map, they're all used. Everything is being taken up. Sometimes people will question, well, why use 5 gigahertz? The, the, the answer really is kind of why not? At this point, with UHF and VHF being sold off and, and being even more congested, we've got the opportunity to use an ISM band that is license-free. In fact, it's license-free up to 4 watts. So off this antenna, you can take 4 watts. And that will give you a tremendous amount of distance. In addition to that, you're playing in a Wi-Fi space as well. For example, the building we're in is using Wi-Fi. So what we need to do is just select an available channel, park the device on that channel because this device is not frequency hopping, and then you'll be able to get your signal through on that channel continuously. In fact, with traditional Wi-Fi, uh, it takes, tends to take turns. It'll send out a packet of information and then say, hey, is there anybody else that wants to send a signal? Go ahead, I'll, I'll wait. I can't ask a band to play or a, a keynote speaker to speak in between packet transmissions. So with Zurium Pro, even though we're using that space, we are constantly transmitting. If the transmitter's turned on, there is something being sent out. Whether or not there's even any audio plugged in here, it will constantly send out a signal. We essentially own the space, as it were. What does that mean? It means that it is not going to be... Uh, your typical VHF, UHF, where you're going to take a couple of paddle antennas, put them on mic stands about 12 feet apart, and go to show. It's time to rock and roll. This is going to be a slightly different animal. It's going to require you to take a little bit of time to make sure that there's a channel available and that you set the power appropriately so that if you're, let's say, sharing a channel with another device, you're not going to step on them. And I'll give you an example of that a little later on. So 5 gigahertz, it's a 6-centimeter wavelength, about a couple inches long. It gets absorbed, uh, reflected by gypsum board, gets reflected by glass, by concrete, and it gets absorbed by water, of which we're all about. Not exactly an environment for either indoors or even outdoors when you're trying to deal with, let's say, 50,000 people, maybe even 5,000 There are challenges to account, and the system does that rather well. There's a five different things that we can do to protect that small waveform. The first thing we do is something called forward error correction. Every network has this type of device typically built into its switch. All it means with Zurium Pro is that you can lose up to 17 contiguous packets of data and still not drop the audio. Beyond that, we do something called concealment. So just kind of picture your mind's eye a uh, gaps in that sine wave. We essentially copy and paste the missing information into that sine wave. Those two things that I just described occur in the first two milliseconds of the latency of the product. The remaining latency is, one, fixed latency is 1.6 milliseconds is for the A to D and D to A conversion that takes place between the two devices. The relationship between those, by the way, and I didn't mention this, you can use one transmitter with one receiver or one transmitter with a billion receivers. It just depends on making sure that they're within range. The receivers themselves are really nothing more than packet snippers, so it's not a bi-directional system. The receiver is just looking for the transmitter that it's been linked to, and as long as it's getting the Zerium or DWA signal, digital wireless audio signal, it goes ahead and puts the output of that to its whatever connector, or whatever module is plugged into the bottom of it. So we've got four direction. We that we also have our, which again, is that module that just has the power connector on it. Imagine if we had to leave the room that we're in right now. So I said, it's going to be reflected by gypsum board and glass, absorbed by water, right? If our room had, if this room was full, perhaps, uh, we would have uh, maybe a little bit more of an absorptive quality to the, to the SHF frequencies that we're transmitting at. In this case, I can take my repeater and just put it outside the obstruction, in this case, the wall or the door, and then retransmit that signal, turn up the power, if you will, and retransmit that signal out to any of the transmitters in range. 
So that's three things. The fourth is the app. And on the app, you will see two things. One, and by the way, we have brochures that are available at, uh, at our, our table, our spot, and you're more than welcome to avail yourselves of those. There's some pictures in there, and then we also have a video on our website that explains a little bit more about the product as well and gives you some of the images that we need. I apologize, I don't have anything for the screen today. But there's two things in terms of signal quality that the system shows you. It shows you the strength of the signal. So you have these bars that run from right to left that show you how strong your signal is. But beyond that, what's unique to this product will help you as an installer or user of it is that it shows you the signal quality based on packet loss. So it's like a street light, green, good, amber, okay, there, but not good. and then red, of course, means that at some point you may lose your signal. You're losing so many packets that you may lose your signal. So again, it's not just the signal strength, but the signal quality that we're showing you. So the app provides that. Then beyond that, if we were to deal with a scenario where you're at a venue, and if you were at that venue, if you were to put on special glasses that would let you see the RF, it would blot out the sun. You've got multi-path all over the place. Well, picture, to try and visualize this, imagine I'm holding on to a bunch of flashlights. Each flashlight's a different color. At this distance, you can easily make out the green one from the red one, from the blue one, from the orange one, what have you. But what happens when I walk about 100 feet away? It starts to blend. It's harder to distinguish that. So let's say, for sake of argument, using light as our analogy here, that my receiver is looking at all of these lights, and it needs to see the red flashlight, but it can't. It knows that somewhere in there is the signal it needs to see. It just can't make it out because of all the other uh, signal that's in the air. Well, in this case, we have a mode in our system called XROC mode. It stands for Extreme Ruggedized One Channel. It's really just a marketing term. But what it does is it takes the transmitter, and when I describe this, I always say that it transmits up to two channels, and that's why. When we turn on XROC mode, it goes from two channels of audio down to one. It's still 20 to 20 kilohertz. It's still uncompressed, uncompanded. It's still the same fixed latency. All of that stays the same. But we're not transmitting with the same amount of bandwidth. So as a result, in fact, we're transmitting at one quarter the bandwidth. So as a result, we have to drop one of the audio channels in order to get that signal through. So that's XROC mode. But at that point, what it does is it increases the headroom enough in that very noisy environment that that red light punches right through. In March, uh, we introduced additional antennas in the way of directional antennas. This particular one here is a 14 dBi antenna. We also offer a slightly larger one that's an 18 dBi antenna. We also added a feature for the receivers called a 30 dB attenuator. This is another way that we protect the signal. And again, the same flashlights, except as you look at them, like I'm staring at that light that's shining on me, it's so bright that I can't but that's where my signal's coming from, so I need to be able to see that. I can put on sunglasses, which makes it more comfortable for my eyes to look at all that light, but what have I done? At that point, I've actually reduced all of the light, including the light I need to see, including the signal that the receiver needs to see. So, we put on a directional antenna, which is like focusing in the signal. Think of it like a, like a cardioid microphone, rejecting the noise that's, or the sound that's coming from around it or and the side, up to the side lobes. It's the same thing with a directional antenna with RF. It's trying to reject that signal that's coming from behind it into the sides. So as a result, it can focus on that light. But the problem we have is that we've still reduced all of the light we're looking at, including the light we need to see. So in that situation, all we need to do is turn up the transmission power on the transmitter just enough so that the light we need to see, or the RF signal we need to see in this case, is a little bit brighter or stronger than everything else that we're looking at. Make sense? All right, let's take you through some practicals on this because I think it'll make you understand better how this product fits into play and what kind of problems you can solve with it based on the things that you'll see in the field. Uh, we had an application last year where we uh, I was there for the 4th of July event in Nashville. Every year they do this event. It's a really fantastic uh, free concert. Um, they have, uh, last year, uh, they had uh, the symphony orchestra playing as well to the fireworks. The backdrop was the Cumberland River. Very nice. In any event, we needed to uh, go from First and Broadway all the way to the Country Music Hall of Fame. And we did that with about 250,000 people there. In that situation, we came out of a transmitter and we went all the way down to Third and Broadway. And then we shot down Third to the Symphony Hall. And then from there, we shot across the Symphony Hall area to Fourth Street, where the Hilton is, and then down to the Country Music Hall of Fame. All of that wirelessly, giving them 20 to 20 kilohertz of audio, uncompressed, uncompanded. So, in order to do something like that, 
there's two things that we had to rely on, two factors that we had to deal with. One is line of sight. In UHF and VHF world, here's my transmitter, here's my receiver, that can be line of sight. There's nothing blocking those antennas. There's nothing keeping that signal from getting through for the most part. They're also dealing with wavelengths that are about one meter in length as opposed to six centimeter in length like we do with SHF five gigahertz frequencies. By contrast, for this, for, for a device like Xerium, this is not line of sight. This is line of sight, that they are in the same plane. It doesn't have to be horizontally, and I'll show you that in a moment. But because we're dealing with five, and this is true with any five gigahertz product, which is why I'm talking about this. When you're dealing with something that deals with wavelength frequencies, that plane needs to be the same in order to make sure you're going to get the best po possible signal from those devices. Now, there are times when front of house might be down here, and my front of house tent, I'm, let's say, maybe eight feet in the air, but I'm up to my J-arrays, I'm um, 20, 30, 40 feet in the air. In those situations, what you would need to do is fairly simple. You can't leave them like this because they're going to be playing side to side. They're not going to go up in the air. It's not going to turn the corner, as it were. But if I turn my transmitter and I turn my receiver, what have I done? I've created that same plane, if you will. They're on the same plane, and they're now directed towards one another. That is a big difference between what you're used to with VHF and, and UHF. So going back to this project in Nashville, uh, before, we, uh, before we went there and set it up, we asked to know what channels we could use. And we were given those channels. We went ahead and programmed our devices, our RF channels, accordingly. Set up the system on two-story scaffolding. And then I actually had a pipe, a riser pipe that I put in place so that I could get up just a little bit higher. Because the second thing I have to be concerned with is something called the Fresnel zone. Um, I want you to picture between these two antennas, I'd like you to picture a football. That ellipsoid shape is the Fresnel zone, okay? And the Fresnel zone changes in size based on two criteria. How far apart the antennas are, so the greater the distance between the antennas, the bigger the football is. And the lower in frequency we go, the bigger the football is. So, to put it in perspective, if these antennas were 300 and the most frequency that Zero Pro transmits on is 4.2 gigahertz. 300 feet apart at 5 gigahertz, that football from, let's say, the laces of the football are in the middle, from the laces down would be 3.8 feet, and from the laces up would be 3.8 feet. Why is that important? Well, with the Fresnel zone, the way we understand this, we want to try and keep any obstructions or reflective objects outside of that zone to the best of our ability. So, for example, that could be the front of house tent. That could be food trucks. It could be human beings. Whatever it is, it could be a cameraman on a platform. All of those things will provide obstructions and or reflections to the signal. So if I know that my antennas are going to be 300 feet apart, much like they were from 1st and Broadway to 3rd and Broadway, I need to make sure that I So if I assume that my ground obstructions are maybe the ceiling of those obstructions is 10 feet, what do I do? I take my Fresnel zone calculation, which I said earlier was 3.8 feet, add that to my ground obstruction ceiling, 10 feet, and I know that these antennas have to be at least 13.8 feet in the air. In my case, I was even taller than that just to give myself additional cushion. But those are the two big considerations you'll have when working with SHF frequencies, or and in this case, the ISM bands that we're dealing with here. What's interesting is that VHF and UHF actually would suffer a larger Fresnel zone simply because the frequencies are lower. So at any given distance, they're wavelengths are longer, there are certain things that can make it easier to get that signal through, which is why the, the, the guitar player can jump into the audience or the lead singer can run around and not, doesn't have to worry about losing that signal. We went from 1st and Broadway to 3rd and Broadway, and what I ended up doing is because I had to change directions the way I needed to, and I still needed to send, change directions again when I went across to the Symphony Hall to, to uh, 4th Street where the Hilton, uh, Hilton Hotel was, I ended up putting a transmitter at 3rd and Broadway. So we transmitted from 1st and Broadway to 3rd and Broadway, where I had a receiver. I wired out of the receiver with a Y cable into my delay tower that was at 3rd and Broad, and then into another transmitter on a different RF channel. And then I sent that signal down to a repeater down 3rd Street where Symphony Hall was. <clears throat> Set up the repeater there, shot it across to the Walk of Fame, and then had another receiver there to pick up the signal, and everything was great. Sound check was good, everyone was happy. I was making some adjustments to the uh, repeater uh, by the Symphony Hall, and I was on a genie lift, and I didn't look quite like I look now. I had been working for probably about 20 hours. I was a bit unshaven, a bit scruffy. Um, and uh, here I am 
you know, in a, in a city that's going to have, they expected half a million people, but because of the weather, they only got half that, about a quarter of a million people, um, setting up this box that had no real description to anybody that doesn't know what it is. Uh, and uh, the police approached me, wanted to know what I was doing. So they asked me to come down rather forcefully. And at the same time as I was coming down to explain what I was doing, uh, the company that I was brought in to, to do the on-site technical for for this product handed me a phone and said, hey, this guy's from emergency services, and he's like really angry. So I took the phone, and there was indeed a very irate gentleman from emergency services on the phone. He explained to me that essentially uh, the trouble they were facing is that every single camera in downtown Nashville was gone. Their entire emergency services department could not see anything in downtown Nashville. So after we got through the, uh, the difficulty of uh, the introductions of what I was doing and why I was doing it, we found out what channel we could use. And in this case, I, I want to say it was channel 153 that was available. I switched my transmitter to 153, and while I was on the phone with him, instantly every single camera came right back up. Why do I illustrate this for you? It was a painful experience. And because when we talk with VHF and UHF, you're really not worried about wiping out every single camera in downtown Nashville. But when you have a device like this, it's not a bad thing. It's just that you've got to understand it's not what you're used to if you're really accustomed to dealing with wireless microphones in your monitors and backpacks. This has a different physics related to it. And there are other pieces of equipment that use the same frequencies. All we really needed was the correct channel to start with, and none of this would have ever happened and it could have been avoided. But it does happen. And even with the best of intentions, the best planning, sometimes it can happen. The beauty of it is, and the reason why I illustrate this, is because all I had to do was simply select a different channel. And by the way, you can select that live. You could have a thousand receivers out there with, our tr with a transmitter. And I'll give you an example of this as well. And you could go ahead and set the channel and live change it and not, the audio will never drop. In fact, there's only really three times audio will drop in a Xerium Pro system. One would be catastrophic failure. Uh, the delay tower crashes to the ground. In that case, you've got a bigger issue than audio anyway. Whenever you turn on that X-Rock mode that I talked about, the transmitter can deliver, where we go from two channels down to one. In order to make that happen, we have to reboot the transmitter so your audio will go down for about five to six seconds. And then the last thing is if you turn on or off delay, and we haven't even touched on this yet, but each receiver has the ability to do up to 3,000 milliseconds of delay, independent delay. So you can use it for your delay towers or anytime you need to do some kind of a time alignment, you can do up to 3,000 milliseconds of delay. So in this case, we were able to get it done. We were able to select the appropriate everything was great. The project that we worked on had uh, challenges because we had three that work along with the frequency selection and the change live. We had three transmitters, each one transmitting to the other two locations. We had at main stage about 10,000 people for the main concert. We had an X Games project going on where they had BMXers and guys on skateboards on half pipes. And then we also had uh, a third area where we had guys on motocross jumping through these flaming hoops. So again, each location had to transmit to the other two locations, but each location also had to receive from the other two locations. This is outside the, this is in Los Angeles, outside the Link Hotel. The additional challenges included the fact that the company that we were doing the work for also wanted to have wireless video and wireless lighting control all at the same show, all at the same time. What could possibly go wrong? Well, uh, we were given our channels. We assigned our devices those channels. Audio check was good. Things were looking great. The video guys, it was their first time using the product that they were using. They were not necessarily super familiar with it. They ended up, our system was on first. Uh, when the main concert started, they brought their system up. But unfortunately, they were occupying one of our channels. So they weren't getting, their, their, their video was coming in and out. In this case, once we knew what channel they were on, we switched the channel of our device, and instantly their system was ready to go, their, their video was clean, and we all played nice together. With the wireless lighting guys, same thing, there was a little new for them as well, and as a result, they were on a channel, nobody even knew what channel, they couldn't even read their own channel because they didn't have the appropriate dongle, apparently, to see into their system. Long story short, uh, they remained on their particular channel. Some of their stuff worked fantastic. You know, they'd move the, t the joystick and that light would move like it was on rails. Other stuff, they'd move it, and then about five seconds later, the can would actually move and the light would do whatever adjustment it had to do. So, in that situation, we were able to change live. There was about 15,000 people total. Um, like I said, 10,000 at main stage, and we never dropped the audio once in that system. So there's a lot of different things that you can do with it. It requires a little bit of planning. We're here, Neutrik is here to help you with that. Um, we're also happy to provide actual training that goes beyond just the 20 to 30 minute uh, you know, uh, speech that I give you along with the spiel 
goes along with it. So we're more than happy to train your team as well. And if you have any questions or you had a, a bid spec or a site plan, we're more than happy to get those and at least tell you whether or not we think it will work. Because there's some times where it won't work. And frankly, you know, this is a wonderful product, but cable's great too. So we love cable, right? We make, wi we make connectors for the end of it. We think it's great. And if you really think about it, I mean, Neutrik has done quite a good job. of saying, well, why did you guys develop this? Well, again, we kind of saw this progression, but who, uh, who better than a, a connector company to figure out how to make you buy double the amount of connectors, right? Because you've got to use two cables instead of one. Now with this, they're just going to be shorter. So Neutrik's done a pretty good job of, I guess, figuring that out as well. But anytime you have situations where the cable run is challenging, where you need to be able to not use UHF and VHF frequencies, where you need to be able to go from building to building across bodies of water, um, any of those types of scenarios where otherwise running a wire would be impossible or cost prohibitive, this should hopefully be an option that you can consider. And again, we're more than happy to help you out with figuring out if it'll work for your particular project. We'll even calculate the Fresnel zone, free space path loss. We're more than happy to help you out with that until you can do that on your own. Any questions at all? That's a fantastic question. So MSRP for antenna, base station, and a module is going to be between $18 and $1,900. And it stays the same whether it's a transmitter or a receiver. The only change is when you go with the Dante module, because we do pay a licensing fee to ordinate, so that'll cost you a little bit more. So for two channels of, of 20 to 20 kilohertz audio, uncompressed, uncompanded, with a fixed latency of 3.6 milliseconds or less, uh, up to a half a mile of distance, you're looking at somewhere around $3,800. So considering what it does, again, if you can run a wire, great. If, you can, if, you can, if, if an in-ear monitor or belt pack is a solution because it's a very short distance, fantastic. But otherwise, if you know you need to be able to do something that isn't going to return ticket sales to 90,000 people, this would be a solution to consider. Thank you. Great question. And if you have any other questions after this, by the way, we, are, uh, we have a little kind of a booth area there. I am more than happy to continue boring you to tears. It's really, it, I do this very well. So by all means, come by, ask any questions you have. Maybe you have a specific application question. I'm more than happy to answer that as well. We do have brochures, so you can take a look at that. And of course, we also have the, the Neutrik the website. And this website, which is actually zeriumpro.net. We couldn't get the .com. So Zerium Pro, who would think that someone would take that name? I don't know. But uh, apparently it must have been popular. So, but zeriumpro.net is available and you can learn more about it there as well. Thank you all very much for your time. I, I appreciate it. Good? Got it?